Let me take a moment and talk about Riverside.fm. It allows you to record studio quality audio and up to 4K video. When you need to record audio and video, Riverside.fm can do it. So if you're looking for a hero platform for all your recording needs, from podcasts to webinars to any video content, Riverside.fm. I've got a promo code for you where you'll receive a 30% discount on the first three months of your subscription. I'll give it to you twice. The promo code is ship it. All one word, ship it, and you'll pick up a 30% discount on your first three months of your subscription. Riverside.fm. Last week on our early pro football teams, we talked about the Shelby Athletic Association and a little bit about the Shelby Athletic Club. But we cover now more on the Athletic Club, 1902 to 1904 seasons, coming up in just a moment in our salute to early professional football history. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And our last week, uh, last Monday, we had our early pro football team series. And we talked about the Shelby Athletic Association teams of the uh, turn of the century, late 1890s, early 1900s, and how they morphed into the Shelby Athletic Club after some fallout uh, with the association. But we're going to continue that story of the Shelby team, the Shelby Athletic Association, first. And uh, we, as we learned last week, they were originally the Tube Works, and then the Shelby Athletic Association, and then the Shelby Athletic Club. And we alluded to it last week that this core team went through some turnover in 1902 when a new team manager, Frank Schiffer, secured some new uniforms for the squad, blue in color. We'll get back to that story in a little bit. Their new coach, though, also in 1902, was Dr. Morton William Bland. He led the powerhouse roster he adopted, along with new players such as Charles Fallis, to another Ohio State championship. News came at the tail end of the 1902 season that completed that Coach Bland would now be stepping down. It was a matter of contention for his resignation uh, by some newspaper accounts over uh, the there was a controversy of a Shelby Athletic Club player named Dave Bushy who played quarterback for the club and that uh, he'd been a key player on that AC squad but he found out allegedly from Coach Bland that the team was making money and uh, poor Bushy was playing for free. Let's just say that caused a little bit of friction between the management and the star player quarterback. Uh, The problem amplified when key figures of the Shelby 11 namely Russell Johnston and Schiffer and others, found out that Bushy got wind of the financial situation of the organization directly from Coach Bland. Coach Bland stepping down seemed to be a mutually orchestrated deal after the trust factor had been damaged between the, the two sides. So the Shelby player Branch Rickey, uh, we've heard that name before, was apparently offered the job of coaching the team, but instead he stepped down too to accept a similar position with the Ohio Wesleyan baseball team. Ricky had been disqualified from playing sports collegiately after he was paid for his services on the Shelby Athletic Club football team. We know that overseeing baseball operations will be a big part of Branch Ricky's future as eventually, if you remember, that name sounds familiar to you? Well, it's because he was an executive with the Brooklyn Dodgers. He would later sign Jackie Robinson, number 42, to a contract, breaking the color barrier of the Major League Baseball. And also, he was responsible for establishing the modern-day farm system of professional baseball. But let's get back to his football. He didn't get too far away from it as he coached his hometown Delaware, Ohio High School 11. And when he was not doing that, he could still play part-time for the Shelby Athletic Club. And he played halfback, he played a little bit of tackle. So in 1903, the coaching duties would be the responsibility of a newly hired head coach, A.J. Newcomb, along with the newly elected captain of the team, Dubby Weiser. 
Frank Schiffer learned a little bit uh, about the whole Bland and Bushy controversy from the year before. Before the 1903 season, to avoid any such complications in the future, Schiffer had each player sign a contract with the club. This included star back Charles Fallis. Charles signings was uh, extremely significant because he became the first black player to scribe his name on a professional football contract. Fortunately, that 1903 contract was sort of in lost to time, but one in 1904 was found, and that's the official document that says that uh, Charles Fallis was under contract, first uh, African-American football player under contract. The securing of Fallis was pretty big for Shelby, too, as the talented young man dashed for long scores time and time again during the next few seasons. The 1903 team was so good that there were even a couple of teams that forfeited games. One such was a game against the Ohio State's medic team. The pregame hype was that Shelby and the medics each had identical records and each had 102 points scored for and zero points scored against uh, on the scoreboard against their defenses. Some good defensive battles, pretty decent offenses too, put up over 100. This was shaping up to be the game of the year and in some respects it might have been. The game was hard fought throughout and the med team had early momentum and led 11-0 at the half. There were some accusations that dirty tactics by the medics team allowed them to score in the first half on a couple of plays. But the Shelby Athletic Club hung in there and wore the OSU Med 11 down with a series of alternating runs by Charles Fallis and Branch Rickey in the second half. The crowd was in a frenzy as Shelby scored and got themselves back into the game. Down by a score, the next series by OSU was pivotal though. They hammered their way with runs up the middle, deep from their own territory. The last one, they rather than punting, they decided to go for it, and they ended up about two inches shy of the line to gain, turning the ball over to Shelby at the Medics' 15-yard line. The spot was contested by the captain and the coaches of the Medics. They pleaded with the officiating crew. They, you know, they felt it was a bad spot. They felt their man had made the ball to the line to gain, but. The officials stuck to their guns. They kept the spot where it was, came up a little short, and uh, the medics coach and his team decided in protest to walk off the field. Well, the officials and game management and Frank Schiffer and just about everybody pleaded with the medics to stay on the field, uh, to come back and finish the game. You know, it's, uh, But it was going to be the Shelby Athletic Club ball at the 15-yard line. But they refused, walked off the field, and by doing so, they were recorded a 6-0 to zero forfeit. So forget about the 11 first half points by the Medics. They were going to get zero in the scorebook, and six points was going to be given to the Shelby Athletic Club. They also, the more important thing is they lost all rights to the gate revenue that they were supposed to get. So all the gate revenue went to the Shelby Athletic Club. And... The very next day, because of that, the medics fired that head coach. Well, next game was not so bright for Shelby, as they not only suffered a 23 loss to a strong Northern University team, but they also lost a couple key players. Branch Rickey, well, he broke his ankle in that game, and Weiser ended up getting knocked out cold in the rough game. They rebounded a few weeks later and knocked off the Columbus Panhandles 22-5 without the services of Weiser, Rickey, and another great player, Fred Turner. Panhandles played hard too, though, and more injuries mounted as even Charles Fallis and Overton alignment were badly bruised and tores of some ligaments in some contests for both those players. And there was another game where controversy arose. The East Akron team, after reading about uh, the loss to Northern, uh, they claimed that they were the state champions now because they had recently beat Ohio Northern University about a week after ONU spanked Shelby. To further pour gasoline on this, the fact that East Akron had canceled a scheduled contest earlier in the season against the Shelby Athletic Club uh, early November that game because they wanted to play an all-coaches team instead from Columbus. Shelby's claim to a third consecutive title was in jeopardy, but they devised a plan. Shelby scheduled a second game with Northern University. The game was heavily promoted, and a special game time of 2 p.m. was put in place so even the hardworking farmers and other businessmen around the area could attend. Now, this was advantageous for Northern, too, because if Northern could come back and beat Shelby again, 
maybe they could get another shot at East Akron, and maybe Northern could be the Ohio State champions. Kind of reasonable they would play that. Well, there was seasonably cold weather and even snowfall that day, but it did not prevent the fans to pack the stadium to witness Shelby avenge its earlier loss to ONU, this time showing a 21-5 victory in the rebound match. Now Shelby would now contest that they were again the champs of Ohio and discredit East Akron's claims because now they had beat Northern. Well, the Akron brass retorted that the champions were not made by claims in the press, but proven out on the football field. East Akron had proof and their circumstances and the evidence they had, they were going to put in a Cleveland newspaper column that said that East Akron should be the champion because they knocked off Ohio Northern by the score of 11-0, to while the Shelby Gritters split both contests with ONU, and even when they defeated Northern, they allowed Northern to score five points. Surely a shutout would give merit to East Akron over Shelby in this state championship contention between the two clubs. The course of both claims changed, however, the next week on December 6th when East Akron entertained the Massillon Tigers 11. Massillon was ready for some questionable tactics of Akron because they were a little bit shady in some of their dealings and that's uh, how they did some of their victories. The Massillon was all ready and they soundly defeated the East Akron team 12-0 allowing Maslin to claim their first Ohio State title. Now, the 1904 season came, and the Shelby AC squad would basically stay intact for the next season. Their big game schedule for the next year would be against those pesky East Akron teams on October 31st, Halloween. Both teams entered the game undefeated. And the game showed how evenly matched they truly were because they had a result being a 0-0 zero to zero tie. War of words between East Akron and Shelby continued in the newspapers as the, each team was claiming the other one played dirty and threw punches and bit and clawed and did everything else uh, unimaginable in the piles. Uh, we know that that stuff does happen. Uh, fortunately, the Shelby team did not uh, suffer any substantial injuries in the Akron game. They had that 0-0 tie, but the following week made even a bigger game because they were going to face the Maslin Tigers, the defending champions from the year before game might just determine who the best team in the state truly was and it was interesting that Maslin hired former Shelby AC captain AJ Newcomb to officiate the contest. It was such a big game that the very special train was contracted to take nearly 600 fans from Shelby Ohio to watch the Maslin matchup live. They were sadly disappointed though as Maslin walloped the SAC 28 to nothing and claims of the Tigers hiring six or seven ringers to play in a game circulated. However, even a staunchest supporter left Maslin knowing that the Tigers truly overpowered the athletic club. Maslin undoubtedly had the better team and the Shelby fans returned home sullen but most said how well they had been treated by the Maslin fans during their visit. Now the Shelby AC 11 played out the rest of the season by blowing out the remaining opponents. They finished with a very respectable 9-1 record and outscored their opponents 317-28 to on the season. Yes, all the points given up by Shelby that season were the 28 points that Maslin had scored on them. And they finished the first five seasons of the new century with 42 shutouts and they only gave up a total of 114 points in five years. And they also put up 882 of their own. That's quite a a great uh, point differential there. Well, the 1905 season seems to be the year that the team morphed into a team many called the Shelby Blues because of those those jersey colors they had for a while. Their ride at the top of football was not over by any means as the Blues would continue to keep Shelby, Ohio on the pro football roadmap for many seasons to come. We'll talk more about that next week on our early pro teams, the Shelby Blues. Make sure you stay tuned for that. We thank you for joining us once again for a Pigskin Dispatch, our early pro team series. We hope you'll join us next week and each and every day because we provide you great football history every day of the year. Also, as another service, we've started the Sports Jersey Dispatch, sponsored by Pigskin Dispatch. It, uh, it's going to bring you information and great sports history of the four major American team sports uh, each and every day of the year. And we do it through the jersey numbers and the apparel and gear that the players are wearing. Learn a lot about the players, learn a lot about the teams, just from what they're wearing in the jersey numbers. So I think you'll look forward to that. Make sure you check that out on your favorite podcast provider. 
Uh, same places you can find Pigskin Dispatch. Well, the Sports Jersey Dispatch. Also, find us the website, jerseydispatch.com. And don't forget to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com. Till tomorrow, everybody, have a great gridiron day. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. A special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order.